Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it happens to be, welcome to Plain Spoken. I am your host, Derek Fournier, and for the first time in this uh, format, I'm joined by a guest, and it's you know great for me because my guest happens to be a dear friend. I've got Bill Anderson uh, with me today, and he's here to share his wisdom uh, and, and things that drive people to come to a company, but more importantly, in my mind anyway, what drives them to stay? Bill brings a wealth of experience in technology and marketing, as well as core communication and public speaking. In fact, I've watched him speak almost countless times, though countless isn't really a thing, even though people throw that word around relatively willy-nilly. Um, in my experience, his communication skills sometimes make him make people forget how technical he can be, and that's one of the, the joys of working with someone like Bill is, is he can transcend the technical gobbledygook and, and actually communicate it. Uh, unfortunately, he's been a friend and a colleague for over 20 years. I'm thrilled to have him, and I'm looking forward to diving in deep. As for background on Bill, I'll let you go into your own background in a second, but uh, I've known you from commercial software development, uh, all of the marketing stuff that goes into that. We were colleagues at Microsoft, and he's done more well beyond that. Uh, data and AI in your, in your later career uh, that you'll get into. Uh, but be, be, beneath all of that, and probably backed in your education, is the strategy and leadership that I watched you exhibit at Microsoft. So uh, how about you just open up by introducing yourself in your own words and, and share some of uh, what got you here? Wow. The pressure is intense. My gosh, thank you for that lead in and, and reciprocated my friend. It's so awesome to spend time like this, whether it's you and I chatting on Sunday morning for coffee or getting an opportunity to do this. So super glad that we were able to go find time. Uh, I mean, in its simplest form, you know, I'm like every other technologist on the planet. I have a degree in communication studies and political science and I was high school teacher. Right. So and I think we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but no, I mean, if you look at my technology, my almost 30 year technology career, you can kind of chunk it into a few places. You're right. I kind of started in product marketing, very customer focused, not traditional five P's of marketing, really more just what does the customer really need to be successful? Right. How are they going to judge us and what are they going to do? And that was kind of the first phase of my career. Uh, the second phase was really pivoting into data, as you alluded to, whether that be data engineering, ML engineering, data science, uh, this crazy AI thing, which we might spend a little time talking about today. In fact, I've been spending a lot of my last couple of years, you know, speaking about and talking to people about responsible use of artificial intelligence and what that really means. And so it really was, it was kind of two different phases that were there spanning those 30 years. You're right, commercial software, you and I worked together on a product that was used by so many commercial customers at one point in time. We had to have legal in the room to talk about our install base, um, you know, taking a <laughs> What you and I started with was a hundred million dollar a year product, and before I collectively left it, it was nine hundred million dollars a year. It was Microsoft's next billion dollar business. So, um, I'm a Midwest kid. You can, you know, you can uh, take the boy out of the country. You can't take the country out of the boy. So I'll be pretty informal, maybe colloquial, unfiltered, off the cuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of my background. That's my journey to get here. And I think you've got some things we're going to talk about that might explore it but I love to just go share what things I've done. And most of it's things I've screwed up. So we'll talk a lot about things that didn't go well and what we learned from them. A few things that actually did, like I don't think you make it to this level and where I'm at at Ford Motor Company without doing some things right. But again, in true colloquial fashion, even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. And so, you know, well, my journey has looked a lot like that, so. Well, speaking of your journey, uh, uh, you know, you transitioned through a number of roles, which is, Admirable. Now, I know when we were back at Microsoft, one of the things was, and our group was atypical in that we had people that stayed there for, uh, they became furniture. Uh, and you used to really move around pretty regularly at Microsoft. But you've not only transitioned within Microsoft, but then outside of Microsoft as well. And sometimes in parallel, doing things that are passion projects. I know you've done a lot of work with your college, 
uh, you know, the Nebraska. Um, tell me a little bit about what that's like uh, and, and what you've taken away from that. What are the pros and the cons? What, what have you experienced through that, that part of your journey? And how has that influenced your leadership style? Because I've never seen you be a follower. Now, I ran into you in 1999 or 2000, I think 2000. Uh, so there's about 23 or 24 years of you being a leader. I'm going to assume at some point you followed somebody. Yeah, no, sorry. I was told there was no math today, by the way. So let's watch that. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it's so first of all, back to our team. Yes, we did coin the phrase from the Eagles. You can check out anytime you'd like, but you can never leave, right? Yeah. We not only had people who never left, but people who left and boomeranged back. It was, uh, it was, it was a fossil bed, right? Um, which was great. I mean, there's a sense of comfort for that. People knew their roles. People really learned trust and how to go execute together. Um, but the pivot thing, I, so the first thing that I learned was is that pivoting is not always my decision. Like if I take a look at some of the major pivots in my life, they weren't of my volition. You know, I pivoted out of being a high school teacher because I wasn't great at it. And I was told by my administration that I wasn't great at it. I actually didn't receive tenure. And so it was an aha for me. My, my path into education, and we've shared a lot in 20 plus years. I don't know if I've shared this. My path was never to be a teacher. Like I had a degree in poly, poly sci and comp studies purely as a pass through into law school. I yep. never planned on being a teacher. And so I went into all of my teacher studies saying, well, I want the skills from comp studies and poli sci so I can go be an attorney. You know, that picturesque scene off of television of standing there in a full courtroom, banging away on a desk that never happens. Um, and, and life got in the way. This, this lady who I'll probably mention a few times, you know, well, my wife, Lisa, of 32 years, but I got engaged and I'm like, I don't want to go into three more years of school. Let's go. Let's go into the workforce. We'll make some money, which was stupid because nobody makes money in teaching. Right. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> I didn't it, know it, it does speak to the educational background you may have had at that point, which explains a few things. Yeah, it does. And uh, <laughs> but no, I got on. I was great in the classroom. I love coaching and mentoring, which I think we'll talk a little bit about. But I was not really ready for the things that I needed to do to go be an educator at that point in time, the administrative duties, I was managing speech theater, debate, mock trial, all those types of things. And, and I just wasn't ready because as I was going through school, I thought that was a pass through. And so my first pivot was really not of my own volition. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that I've learned. And when I teach, when I talk to university students that I'm teaching and coaching, it's the first thing I let them know is, is that a number one skill they need to learn how to do is to pivot. And sometimes it may not be intentional. Now, the world gets this, right? There was this thing a few years ago called COVID. The world had to pivot. You know, work shut down. Some jobs got eliminated. People had no choice but to try and go find something different. And so some of those pivot moments in my life have actually not been out of my own volition. Uh, and so I think for a lot of folks, the thing I would encourage them to take away is, you know, flexibility, adaptability. Uh, there's a crazy book from a dude at Gallup 100 years ago called Soar With Your Strengths really grounding yourself in the things you do know as a confidence point and a stepping off point to something new and different. Um, but just plan on it. I mean, Lisa and I were speaking to a group of college seniors about three or four years ago. And these kids are so convicted, like they know what they're going to do 20 years from now. And our message to them was, you don't know what you're going to do 20 years from now. I'm telling you, you don't know what you're doing two years from now. And so being that convicted and directional is great, but you have to really make sure that your plan forward includes plans for change or at least flexibility and adaptability. It's it's really interesting uh, when you use the word pivot, and you know I'm a fan of, of, of words in general. Um, pivot speaks uh, to predictive or planned action. I'm going to pivot. I'm going to take an action. And But when you describe the necessary skills to survive a pivot, right, you are speaking reactionary, which makes more sense, right? The pivot is usually just, you think you pivoted. You may have made an elective decision to leave job one and look for job two, but the reaction to job two or job three or scenario four uh, is really where the power is. And, and I want to loop this back to something you said earlier. Uh, when I first left Microsoft and went out to work for a partner company called Intrinsic, I remember the first speech I gave because when I left, uh, for those for backstory, the product we worked on was a product called Systems Management Server. Uh, it was loathed at the time, but it was on its way back like Phoenix from the ashes, as Bill uh, Bill pointed out. Um, but at the time, I was one of the foremost technical experts on it on the planet. And so I got to do these cool speeches to other really, really smart people who had tried to make this steaming pile of shit work for an inordinate amount of time. And we were making it less a steaming pile of shit. 
And I remember opening up this presentation in Chicago at the Microsoft uh, office in Chicago. And I said, listen, make no mistake. I'm not better at this than you are. I've just screwed it up far more times than you have. I have seen every mistake possible, mostly of my own causing, right? <laughs> and I think in life, the more we can see that mistakes are really just opportunities to learn and how you respond to them is really where the power is. No, totally agree. And I think self-awareness is critical to that. And I'm not here to go claim on pivot one that I was that self-aware. My emotional IQ <laughs> was reasonably, again, you can ask my wife, my emotional IQ <laughs> was, was not necessarily high up the proverbial thermometer in, in measuring it at that point in time. Um, but it's interesting being able to go back and look through those pieces and think about them now, now that I'm a little bit more aware uh, and using those as learning points. You know, how do you make sure you, you acknowledge your strengths and weaknesses? You know, really go into a situation. For a while, my auto signature was some crazy quote that I made up that said, true genius is knowing what you don't know with the same courage and conviction that you know what you know. And, and that was something that I really tried to go focus on for a while, just consciously going into a situation and whether it be as a leader of a team, whether it be a strategic leader of a product or an organization, whether it be coaching and mentoring, like just openly declaring, hi, my name is Bill. I know these things. I definitely don't know these things and getting very crisp. Like when I, even yesterday I was talking to my team about some stuff and I said, Hey, look, you guys know me. I'm, I just, I can definitely separate what I know and what I think. And I'll be very clear about the distinction between those two. And I think that was one of the big key takeaways there is that being that self-aware declaring what you don't know, um, because otherwise you just go in with false confidence. And I think every 20 something year old does that, right? We're going to conquer the world and we're going to cure hunger and cancer and crazy things and cats and dogs living together in harmony kind of stuff. Right. And, and uh, just having that awareness and being able to say, no, I actually don't know here is super important in pivoting because otherwise you'll actually go into something blind. You'll say, oh, no, no, I think I know this. Like, there's, there's three fit things. I know, I don't know, I think I know. And that third phase is the worst bucket. Like, it's absolutely the worst bucket, which is I think I know something. You know, it's it's interesting. The, the phrase that you uttered there, I have said something very similar many times, right? And, and I think that there's an interesting uh, approach. And I know that I use it uh, intentionally now. I probably happened into it. Uh, and then became intentional about it as I've gotten older. Um, I think that the humility that's expressed by acknowledging the things you don't know is one of the foundational elements to building trust with a person or a team. Because if you come forth uh, under the auspices that you know everything, people know that's not true. Nobody knows everything, right? And it is, it's not a human position. And so by expressing these things you don't know, you're building that connection. You're allowing them, in fact, to acknowledge that there are things that they don't know. And you're you're allowing fallibility. Like we've all heard these these ridiculous aphorisms. Failure is not an option. No, it's actually the, the most likely option, right? Success is actually the less likely option for most scenarios. Um, and then one of the other things you, you kind of dropped into, and I can't remember the philosopher you may, because I don't remember, but I think you dabbled in some philosophy in school. Um, it may have been Descartes. That binary model, right? Fail or succeed, know or don't know. It's so warm and comforting for us as human animals, but it is so not the way it works, right? It allows us to, to separate wheat from chaff, right? It allows us to go through and, and sort. It's a great sorting model, but it is incredibly imperfect. And when you pull humanity into it, working with teams, and this is the next uh, thing I want to get into with you on, because I know you and I both share a tremendous love for the creation of high performing teams and an easy description of that is a team where two plus two equals five, right? You, anything greater than the sum of its parts is on the road to a high functioning team and is really a magical thing to create. Um, but, but your leadership philosophy, 30 years in, right? Multiple large companies, educational background, and, and with kids all the way up to old folks like us, right? How is it? How has it matured over the years? And 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 could you paint that with a brush? Uh, because you've had some really big companies like Microsoft and like Ford Motor Company, uh, but you've also done some independent stuff right on the side and, and stuff on your own. Tell me how your leadership philosophy has evolved over these years. Uh, well, first I needed to get one. 
right? Like, <laughs> and, and I say that, I, I say everything flippantly, um, which when we talk about my leadership philosophy, we'll talk about why. But I, literally, I had to have one. I was fortunate enough to have a mentor. His name was Kirill Fainov, who's no longer with us. He was actually in, in charge of high performance computing at, at Microsoft. And it was my first leadership, my first manager position. I always distinguish the two. People lead, management is a title in an address book somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And it was my first actual management position and I had to go build a team from scratch. And his first piece of feedback to me was, you need to really get grounded on what you are as a leader and a manager. And it was a great opportunity to think through what those things were. And part of it was, what am I as a leader? And part of it was, in general, what do I want for my team? Again, I kind of, separate the two of those out even though they conflate together pretty heavily um so literally seriously i had to get one like holy cow and i couldn't go to ms market and go find one it wasn't a shop thing i could <laughs> the internet you haven't you haven't been away from microsoft long enough because you still drop ms market for those of you who don't know for, <laughs> that was an internal site that we could buy things on that you just dropped so any microsoft who's listening to this will have just chuckled and their friends are like what the hell are you laughing for sorry i should have said amazon you can't go to amazon yeah. I exactly. And I'm not even sure. Well, let's see. Had Al Gore invented the internet at this point? Yeah, this would have been circa like early 2000s. So it was he was around. still struggling with an O or an OE on potato at that point, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, this wasn't a thing you could just go grab. There were books, there were things. And, you know, his guidance to me was just sit and stay convicted about who you are as a person, what's important for people that you work with. And that's how I really kind of formulated it. And then I've tried to evolve it over time as I've matured. I think there's a misconception or a misbelief that our personalities stay stagnant through our life. Like if you go take Myers-Briggs and we all know our numbers or our sorry, you all know our letters, right? right? There's a belief that those don't move. And the reality is they move. They move a lot because they're a statement about not necessarily who you are, but a statement about your energy levels. You know, do you derive confidence and energy from something or not? Uh, cause you can do everything like the human brain's infinitely capable. It's really just about what our default actions are. And so, you know, I kind of spent some time to go really get convicted about that in that moment. And then what I've done is I've gone through life, you know, there are pieces that shape me that kind of change that. Um, uh, one that's super near and dear to your and my heart is our beloved friend Brady. And I would, I would, you know, I don't wish this on anyone, although I think it's a journey that I look back with with a lot of with a lot of honestly love and joy that going through a person's last two years of their life as they're fighting terminal cancer. Uh, trust me, my my uh, my J moved a whole lot closer to F uh, in that two year window as far as not only being aware of it, but dialing it up and using it and being comfortable with it and driving energy from it. Um, so, so I think, you know, I got grounded in who my personality was really put like four or five pillars together that I cared a lot about. And then over time, I literally just try and take as the world moves me, I try and go look at how those things might change. You know, am I adding a, an arrow to my quiver? Or am I taking an arrow out of my quiver? Hopefully it's all additive. Hopefully I'm not throwing anything away. Um, but you know, as I go through, I think I've, I've been able to go accumulate more of those pieces over time. So uh Two things. One, uh, I did not expect to broach the Brady topic on this chat, but I think it's a really good one to broach for a number of reasons. So I, I want to put a pin in it. About any of this stuff you want to talk about without mentioning that to your no, program. I totally get it. I, I wasn't trying to avoid it. I just didn't. It didn't occur to me, mm -hmm. not because I don't think about Brady, because I think about Brady all the time. You know, the reason one of the reasons, the main reasons I go to New Orleans every year, right, is to have coffee down by the river. Um, and uh, so we we I think it's the beauty of something like this is to have these conversations that while they may have an outline, they are not scripted. It's funny when I used to coach on public speaking, um, I used to talk about I hate scripts, right? Waypoints. I, I want waypoints because if you have a script, you can screw up, right? If I'm supposed to say these 400 words, I might say 300 of them correctly, but 100 wrong, and then I think I've screwed up. Um on a couple of points, and I want to come back to the Brady thing because I think it's going to be very powerful for folks. Um, arrow in the quiver, but arrow out was interesting as well. So I agree. I think additive is good. We we learn new skills. We acquire these abilities, et cetera, et cetera. The arrow out is not necessarily bad because the elective choice to determine, I either don't do this well and I don't care enough to get better, right? Because I don't have the passion, interest, capabilities. Like I'm never going to be an NBA center for a litany of reasons, not the least which being I'm six foot tall, right? Uh, it also is a great lesson in coaching, 
delegation, team management, finding people who who that is their passion or their the the phrase was their why became all the rage over the last 10 years, right? Uh, I have a dear friend I've worked with since I was 19. He is an infinitely better manager of operations than I am. I create order out of chaos. He is incredibly good at refining that model and managing order, right? And that's a very distinct skill set. But let's let's go back to Brady. So we don't have to give tremendous details, but the human side of, well, of who we are, that's almost a weird redundancy, um, is often overlooked. When you look at the management tomes and the leadership books and all of these things, I know there was a, a period of time where emotional intelligence was all the rage and people talked about it and EQ became a big thing. But because most people suck at it, uh, people stop doing it, right? It was like, well, I would also like to be a long jumper, but I am fat and I don't long jump well, so I'm going to stop doing it. People stop with EQ. How? Tell me more about how that process changed who you were and how did it help you express something that I had expressed to me in my leadership journey, which was I had to learn how to become vulnerable. Vulnerability is a superpower. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so let me talk about the starting point. Um, a few years before that, I was, you know, you and I were partnering together. I was leading a marketing team and trying to go lead a product, as you called it, back from the ashes, right? Uh, which you and I were there jointly together on the infamous apology tour, right? And we can <laughs> we can spread some color about the, about where the product was, but just to set it so people know, at the time, a guy by the name of Jeff Rakes, who you might know now, um, he's a partial owner of the Seattle Mariners, was head of worldwide sales at Microsoft, was the head of the Gates Foundation for a while. He's a big deal, right? He was the head of American sales. And there was another guy named Steve Ballmer, a bigger deal, right? Owns, <laughs> owns the Clippers, was CEO of Microsoft for a while. They actually had an email exchange about taking the product off of the Microsoft price list. So just so people know where Derek and I were at on this product, that's where it was at. Anyway, so fast forward, I'm doing marketing stuff and trying to go lead a, a field partners, engineering team, marketing team with just some energy through this chaos. I get a review and uh, David Hamilton, who's still a friend of mine, who I love to death, gives me my, re my review at Microsoft. We used to do annual reviews and there would be text about things you did well and did poorly and you get paid some and it's kind of, you know, standard review process. My review, said that Bill is caustic and does not suffer fools gladly. Now, granted, this is... So, so it was positive then, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is the point. So let's get back to the topic. <laughs> to me, most likely it was. Yeah. My, my leadership skill, my personality, my energy was pushing things forward at whatever cost, even if that meant that there was a wake of dead bodies. And, and that was it. Now, granted, where we were at, that may have actually been the right thing to do to be able to have that level of courage and conviction and fearlessness and lack of recognition for the people around me moving forward. Um, fast forward through our good friend, Brady Richardson, who we who was a direct report of mine as well as my one of my best friends. So here I am as a manager and being a best friend through his two year battle with terminal cancer. Um, coming out of that, I actually believe one of my strongest arrows in my quiver is empathy, vulnerability, sincerity, and trust. And I never had that. I never had that at all. And part of that was getting rid of a little bit of that bombasticness that got me that uh, Shakespearean comment in my review about not suffering fools gladly. It's, it's one of the curses working for a Brit. Um, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, then we had an argument afterwards whether that phrase was biblical or whether it was Shakespearean. That's what we did. Um, but but it was a complete transition for me and it was it was at least a reduction of use of an arrow i think i still have that as a go-to like i haven't completely tossed it out but it's used far less and now literally i have a peer of mine who worked for me for a few years at microsoft and now is a peer of mine at ford and he constantly reminds me when he models himself after different leaders he models his empathy after me like that's a that's a chasm Right. That's literally like you or I going from what we're doing now to being a long jumper. It's pretty significant jump, pun intended. But but it's you know, it's being it's being aware of those transitions and being uh, being able to embrace them um, and, and follow them along. There's just there's a book worth of learning along that journey, you know, about just awareness, you know, things you have to go understand that I use every day. 
like there are things with my team that I still will go say, you know what, you're going through something that I, I can't tell you that I understand. Like that was thing one, because I didn't understand what terminal cancer was. But there are a lot of things that my team goes through that I can now openly start with, you know what, I feel so terribly for you and I can't tell you that I even understand what you're going through. And being willing to do that, like we derive confidence from knowing crap. Yeah, right? that's what we do. You know, go back to your binary point. You know, it's easier if you live in black and white, even though the world is gray. You convince yourself that it's black and white. Why do we have generalizations? Because it makes us feel like we know something. I can go generalize that those short people are going to behave a certain way. And it makes me feel confident because now I can look at short people and say they're going to behave a certain way or do certain things or what have you. Like, it's it's really hard to not to, to give up. I don't want to say this to have the confidence to not be confident to absolutely have enough confidence in yourself to go say, you know what, it's okay for me to admit right now that this is a thing I don't know and understand. And that person is going through something I don't know and understand. When COVID hit, I had a direct report of mine who was from Wuhan, China. Mm. Her family actually had COVID in December of 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not making an international statement now, right? But literally she had multiple family members on ventilators in hospitals. Uh, in 2019 and her journey through COVID being a Chinese American mm -hmm. in a world where we were ratcheting up volume and anger and resentment toward people from China. You know, she came to me and she says, I've been in this country for 20 years and I don't feel safe enough to actually send my kids to school right now. And, and that's just those situations being able to be confident enough to not be confident in the moment, being able to be confident enough to go say, my gosh, I can't even imagine what you're going through right now. It's you know, just it's, of arrows I've added. It's it's interesting. I uh, that was a blind spot for me too. And again, this isn't a political statement about COVID, but I have a dear friend who was at the time an executive recruiter. And now she works for a private equity firm, who's uh, Asian and lived in California. And I was speaking to her, and she was headed back east, uh, or no, to Vegas, I think it was. Um, and I was asking why. She's like, I, I don't feel comfortable here. I'm getting sideways looks. I'm getting people saying things. And listen, you, you made a joke about being a country boy. And, and when you say country, you mean from like the Midwest-ish. I don't know where Nebraska really is. I went to school in Florida. And that is actually the South, even though people chop us off. And unless you're in, you know, the northern part of Florida, southern part of Florida is considered not the South, apparently. But I was completely oblivious. Like I had heard the rhetoric and I, and I'm, and I was sure it was there. But unlike other, you know, societal pressures, I, it, it wasn't real to me until I had it. And the other, the other thing I want to go back to, we talk about not knowing things and how we uh, group things. We do. We we like generalizations because it allows us to to derive secondary conclusions, right? It, it allows us to make a secondary assumption based on the primary foundation. Uh, and uh, my coach, uh, my executive coach, who I adore from a company called Talentism. Uh, they talk about in their their intellectual property the concept of certainty and how certainty is actually a risk. If you are certain about something, that's the time you should realize you should investigate the hell out of it because certainty is not something we are typically afforded in this life. So you should design some experiments and figure out why the hell you are so certain because you are probably experiencing a blind spot. Um, yeah, no, so it's, it's really interesting. It's a great point. It goes back to, you know, my commentary earlier about knowing what you don't know with the same courage and conviction, you know, what you know, and, and, and being very aware of that. I also think we give ourselves false certainties for confidence. My favorite, you know, sticking on our kind of leadership um, coaching mentoring is I love to go talk to new managers who think that they're a manager. Like, it's crazy because I learned this as a high school teacher, too. This is my classroom. I'm in control. Um, I don't know how much flexibility I have to curse on, on said podcast. You're, you're fine. Um, but that's just bullshit, right? I mean, that is complete BS. It's, it's ignorance. It's absolute unawareness. And managers today, oh, you know, I'm the manager and they'll do what I say. I literally was talking to a peer the other day and we were talking jointly about a person who were trying to jointly coach uh, their manager and them together. People I actually both used, to, I used to work with both of them and I love them dearly. And I'm like, I love you both and we got to work this out. But I'm talking to my peer and she says, well, some point in time, Bill, it, it, the manager just has to make the call and the person has to do what the manager says. And I'm like, I, I, again, 
dialed down my caustic, dialed up my empathetic and said, you know, Vicky, I can understand that. Um, but I don't know that that's necessarily the case nowadays. And I'd encourage you to maybe think differently about that. Um, Cause it's just a ruse, right? I mean, it's an absolute lie. Employees can go anywhere they want to. They can choose to do something different. They can choose to be nefarious. They can choose to be, you know, passive aggressive. You have no control. You have, you have one, we have, you have one enforcement point. You, you might be able to terminate them. You may choose to give them less money. So I guess in theory of two enforcement points, I, but that's kind of it. Outside of that, out of the 365 days a year as manager, I have like three enforcement points as a manager that I can influence something. But in the rest of those 365 days a year, I have lots of things as a human that I can influence them with sincerity and trust and coaching and guidance and collaboration. Like my influence, you know, if you remember our beloved, Microsoft had this crazy thing called the competency wheel. It was 30 different things in multiple colors with a little spinner thing in the middle of it. And, and one of the biggest competencies we, sees we used to talk about is influence without authority. And I still use that as a manager. I just don't tell myself that I have the right to go tell my team they have to do something. I still use that on a day-to-day -day basis to go find, how am I going to influence them to do this? I have, it's a reward season for us. Yay. Um, but, hey, at but, least there are rewards. Look at the bright side. Uh, the, the beauty is I get to have these conversations. So I, there's a number that's associated with it that we all have to talk about, but it's really more about what brilliant, amazing things have you done? What more amazing things can we grow you into? How can I sign up to commit to help you with that, right? But I'm constantly looking at that, not saying, I need to tell you to do this. I'm looking at that saying, how do I, when I'm talking to Fu today, how do I influence he or she to go make sure that in the next three months that they're getting this done and doing this better, right? We, it's just a ruse. Like if, if you have that much confidence and conviction, you're right, you're wrong. <laughs> the one thing you can be certain of is that you're incorrect, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I think that in order to write books and to produce speaking tours, we have to come up with the next great idea about how things are to be done. And that becomes the way we do them for some period of time. And, and, and then we, the contrarians come out Contrarians are super in vogue right now, so it doesn't matter what is said; they're going to say the opposite, and that's going to create, you know, conversation. And conversation isn't, you know, I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to conversation. I think uh, conversation's great. I think uncomfortable conversations even greater at times, right? Because when we're in positions of discomfort, uh, it's sometimes where we have to really investigate our positions, or our thoughts, and our, our stances. Um, but but a couple of things that came across in the discussion is, and I I've beaten this drum for some time: management versus leadership right? Managers enable, it is a required task. There's, there are things that need to be done and, and there's nothing wrong with management. I, I actually think management is a very good tool set. Uh, it's very useful, especially when you're scaling an organization, et cetera, et cetera. Leadership and management are not synonymous. They're not even close to synonymous. And that leadership component goes to that influence without authority. If I take the word authority to its natural conclusion, to your point earlier with what you can do to someone, and make no mistake, I mean, what can you do to someone? Because the implication people make is they have to do what I say eventually, right? There are only a few models where that is true, and none of them are places we want to live, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any of the ones we want to live in, they don't have to do anything. Now, if we take away all of the extremes, and the extremes are sometimes useful for talking points, but rarely useful in real life. I used to call them trump cards, right? Uh, I think it's from an actual card game where you could trump someone with a certain card. I don't I don't play cards other than poker, um, so I don't know. But you're shaking your head, so I, I guess I'm on track there. As a leader or a manager or in a group where you happen to be the one calling the shots, right, sometimes there are reasons you have to just go, right? In my previous organization, we had borrowed it from someone. We sure as hell didn't in invent it. Uh, disagree and commit. If you're in a group of te a team, you're, you're hashing it out, but you're time bound. You're resource bound, whatever, and time happens to be the resource here. You have to come up with the best next step. But what you can't do is if you take those steps and you start going at that vector and it falls apart, you can't have people coming out saying, I told you so, right? And that's a really hard skill that I was very proud and our team were able to do because if we went in that vector and it was wrong, we just said, well, we, we chose the wrong vector. But make no mistake, we chose it. We chose it together, right? And the authority was the authority was granted by our group to our group to make that decision. Right. So it, it's interesting when you talk about a traditional team, um, you know, collaborating with your team to get them empowered 
sometimes feel inefficient. I, I remember some of my early, early failures as a leader um, were all around, I can just do this faster myself. Like I'm not going to teach this person. And it wasn't that I thought less of that person or I thought they were not smart or capable or whatever. Uh, it's a typical dilemma when you're trying to learn how to delegate. Oh, I'm just going to have to correct this a thousand times and then I can do it the way I want to. Not the way you want to, surprise, is probably okay. In fact, you may learn something if they do it differently. Um, and not to mention that if you do it once for them, guess what? You get to do it again. It's the gift that keeps giving. But if right. you do it in a way that actually gives them the skill and competency, and I warn my every team that I'm on, I literally give them like an early disclaimer and warning. Warning, I'm an ex-high school teacher. Sorry. I will try not to do anything that makes it sound like I'm talking down to you in any way. And if you if you hear me go rogue teacher, you know, um, preachy on you, please stop me. You have the right to to give me the Heisman pose, right? Put your hand in my face and stop me. Um, but you know, skills transfer is the number one thing that I try and spend my time on as a as a leader is how do I go spend time to go get people those skills? And it's the old fishing and, you know, fishing cliche. Uh, it even happened yesterday. I was talking to my dev manager peer and he was literally just gonna go solve something. I said, no, person X on my team needs to get that skill. I, it got a little preachy and sanctimonious because I went into Bloom's taxonomy, which is another thing that we educators have to know about. And I'm like, look, she lives in this level of rote memory and analytics, but I need to get her to creation and synthesis. She's got to be able to go do this because otherwise you and I have to keep doing it. So these have these things happen. If if you're really if, if you live in a world that you trust your coworkers and they trust you, um, if you live in a world you sincerely just want to make people better, and that sincerity is really important. Otherwise, it comes off teaching and coaching comes off as sanctimonious, and that's yes. like a major turnoff, right? So if you live in those particular world, I mean, your slide title was talking about human centered leadership, right? If you live in those worlds technical prowess can be transferred. If you don't live in that world, I don't care how technically amazingly, there you go, there's the title, see? I don't care how technically amazingly deep you and I were on systems management server. If our customers didn't sincerely trust us, those messages would have never landed. Like we would have never gotten through that. Whether it's managing a team and coaching them or you know, having trust and sincerity from a, a group of people who are trying to go follow along. I mean, if you don't have those pieces, it doesn't matter. You you alluded to something earlier when you were discussing Myers Briggs types and how we change over time. I, I thoroughly agree. Uh, I don't know that we shift massively, but I definitely know that that we shift. And I think when you have significant events in your life, they can cause more significant shifts. But that that cultural change or that that shift can can be driven by cultural change too. Now you've managed international teams, so have I. Uh, and so as a a little primer for this next uh, segment here that we're going to talk about. When I left Microsoft originally, you had alluded to some of the cultural norms when we were there. Now, it has changed significantly since we've been there, or since I've been there, for sure. You were there more recently than I, and I remember coming back to visit and seeing my old friends, and you know there were just little things that were changed, and then there were big things that were changed. When I was there, it was get the job done by any means necessary, right? It was absolutely, and I loved that, right? but there were bodies on both sides of the road, make no mistake. And when I left, I would do that. And I remember fast forward many years, skip an entire uh, career with Intrinsic. I was working with a colleague at Virgin Voyages who was very, very bright. And he took me aside one day and I had brought another former Microsoft person over, my friend Paul, who you also work with. Um, and he goes, listen, I get you Microsoft guys. I've worked with you before. Not everyone responds to that. Now I know there are times where you have to dial things up Right when you're in the heat of battle, air quotes, and everyone uses ridiculous, you know, uh, comparisons and 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 stuff to battles and wars and stuff like it's just work. It's it's just software. Like unless you're working on medical software where people literally can die because of what you do. Generally speaking, oh my god, they got on the cruise ship late. Who gives a shit? Right? We'll figure it out. But the people you work with are the ones you have to be more careful with, right? And so if you're running around stomping on their souls because they didn't understand something, it's a challenge. So as you reflect on your career, look at that, uh, scope it to narrow first, and then think about that attitude and how it translated. I had a, a development team in India, which is a, a very different culture. Now I'd worked with folks from India, from Pakistan, from China, from all over at Microsoft. 
But at Microsoft, Microsoft didn't give a single shit about where you were from at the time because now you were in Microsoft land and you would adapt to Microsoft land stuff, right? When we left Microsoft land, you had to realize that there were other things out there. And the things that we would say to one another with no issues whatsoever were taken as strong indictments and questioning people's value. Have you... What's your journey been like in that world, in a multicultural world that's increasingly multicultural by every day? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's two things to tease apart there. Um, it's been very interesting this week. This was the 10-year anniversary of Satya taking over as the CEO. So there's been a lot Holy of- Holy cow, uh, 10 years. 10 years, yeah. 10 years ago today, or 10 years ago last week, was the the meeting in over in the Xbox building in one of the studios where Satya Nadella was introduced as the new CEO of Microsoft and Steve Ballmer was was moved out and Bill was there to kind of be part of the transition. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of writings about the culture of Microsoft. So for those of you who don't know, I would encourage you to go do, I, I'm still a religious seller, like I can't use Google as a search engine. So I would encourage you all to go Bing search. Um, <laughs> Microsoft organization meme. And there's this crazy picture from about 20 years ago that talked about the org charts of major tech companies. And the one for Microsoft is a circle with three guns all pointing at each other. Like that was <laughs> that was the culture of Microsoft, right? Well, that's where we got to. Be brief, be bright, be gone. Um, and uh, and Satya pivoted that on one major thing. And, and I'll make this fast, and then I'll get back to the topic, um, which is, he, he changed the rewards system. He brought on this thing called growth mindset, which is a bunch of research from some PhDs at Stanford and other places that's super interesting, but it's gelatinous. Like it's hard to get your head around growth mindset. It's one of those kind of shrink your head training classes that you take. Um, but it got very concrete when we changed the rewards and the rewards moved to three pivots. Pivot one, what did you do that was impactful this year? Yay you. Two, in doing that, demonstrate how you leveraged the work of others in delivering on your impact. Three, where did you take the things you were working on and contribute to the impact of others? So now all of a sudden, if you take traditional Microsoft culture, which was number one, for those of you who are tracking along, you got a third of your bonus. If you didn't do those other two vectors, if you couldn't demonstrate those, you literally got one third of your rewards as far as your bonus and your stock goes. You would put in a, we always had weird numeric buckets ranging from anywhere one to four, one to five, depending on when you're in the company. Sometimes one was good. Sometimes it was bad. It never made sense. <laughs> HR confused me. But anyway, I think we learned that from Vegas. It's like chips. It's not real. It is. Uh, but that's how they changed the culture. That to me was the single most impactful thing in changing the culture. There were lots of things about, um, you know, planning on failure and other kinds of stuff like that, rewarding failure. But that to me was the piece that put the guns down. Um, anyway, so you asked back about what I've learned transitioning out of an existing culture into new cultures. And I'm but generalizing at that one. Oh, I want to I want to hold you before that, because I do want to get into that one. I want the multicultural one. But you, you brought up something that triggered a thought and I want to keep it together. The Microsoft model that had the one finger, and it wasn't the one finger that you're thinking of. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you can't see it, but it wasn't the middle finger. Um, it was all couched in the concept of meritocracy, which has become in vogue once again. And there's something that's good and warm and, and nurturing about a meritocracy. The best person for the job should get it. The person who does the most should get all the rewards. But at Microsoft, it had gotten to be cancerous yeah. because only through stopping anyone in your level could you get the share of the awards you you should or rewards that you thought you should get there was no fostering of uh what i'll call second bananas you need teams need leaders certainly but they need team members too to amplify that two plus two equals five requires an entire team of people they can't all if, if too many chiefs and not enough indians which is now apparently a terrible thing to say which i get why we're more culturally aware and sensitive but you got to have people that are part of the team and they're okay with being part of the team. And those people got drummed out of Microsoft before that change. Too many chefs in the kitchen. There you go. You can transition to that one. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot more sense, right? I'm, I'm with, all your food, with all your food work, right? But That's so, true. So, so let me counterpoint, though. It's still a meritocracy. It's just a different set of measures yes. to go measure it. And that's, you know, yes. we've worked in systems management for a thousand years, right? Um, measures create behaviors. Like if you go give a measure, if you put a metric in place or some kind of measure of success for an employee in your team or anybody, even if they're not a direct report of yours, that creates a behavior. And we need to be very, very careful that sometimes those metrics create contrarian behaviors. 
or mm -hmm. outcomes that you didn't necessarily yeah. investigate. Unintended and consequences. So it's still a meritocracy. It's just that yep. the metrics are different in how they go think about stack ranking and how they go and think about making statements about how awesome you are and how much you get paid and promotions and things like that. It's still very much that way. They're yep. still judging you on that. It's just that they've got a new set of judges with a new set of criteria, right? It's kind of like yeah. trying, trying to determine a complete pass in the NFL. It's yeah, funny. Uh, it's, it's probably the, the, the word individual in front of meritocracy would probably have made that better, right? It used to be a very individual focused meritocracy. And in fact, when you build compensation models, quite often you try and build in things that enhance or uh, bring in team concepts. And then people are like, well, I, why should I be held responsible if the rest of my team doesn't achieve this goal or that goal? Well, because it's a team goal, right? You, you, you have to collaborate. So ways to foster that so that people are all collaborating towards that end are incredibly important. But now let's get back to the cultural uh, shifts, I think, because I think yeah. that's an interesting topic. Yeah, and I think, like I said, I want to generalize it relative, not to, to something specific about the multi-trillion dollar behemoth in the Pacific Northwest, more just a generic statement about understanding cultural differences as you, as you pivot out, as you transition. Um, and so what I kind of learned about that was, first of all, it starts with self-awareness. You, again, most of these things really start with self-awareness. I was very aware when I left Microsoft that I was still a Microsoft bigot. I was a zealot. My last four <laughs> digits of my cell phone number are MSFT. Um, I still, <laughs> I've, I've never in my life launched a Google, launched um, Chrome, nor have I gone to Google.com. Wow. Right? And and I've never elective elective ignorance. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, no, but I was aware of it, right? It, so at least I know. It's kind of like yeah, it's elective. <laughs> I know, and knowing's half the battle. Um, so, so I was aware of it as I transitioned in the United Health Group. I was also aware of the industry perception of people coming from big tech in general, not just Microsoft, and kind of our supreme confidence bordering on arrogance. Uh, you know, in fact, one of one of my first conversations at Optum Labs, which is a subsidiary of United Health Group, was talking to somebody who was a 20-year healthcare veteran, and and they were trying to go build this kind of um, incubation innovation lab from a bunch of tech leadership, right? That's how I ended up there. And, and she's like, you know, and you tech guys don't come in here and preach to us about how easy these problems are. If they were easy, we would have solved them 20 years ago. And, and so being aware, being cautious about that, being quiet in meetings. So I think I did a lot of the right things to be able to transition in because otherwise I knew there was an expectation that I was gonna be one of those arrogant tech guys coming in. But, but the thing, same thing applies to every piece of pivot. You've got to know coming in, you've got to be aware of yourself, what your strengths and weaknesses are. I have a, a, a friend of mine who was a great mentor, a guy by the name of Bob Muglia, who told me, he's like, look, when you think about transitions, think of your skills as levers and don't take a new gig where you're changing all the levers at the same time. Like right. for anybody who's a Monty Python fan, please don't go from being a banker or an accountant to being a lion tamer. Like there's an old skit that does that, right? changes too many levers. But if you want to go from being a banker to an accountant, rock on, right? That's a good transition. And so be aware of those pieces and be aware of the perceptions. I think that's the other thing that I didn't necessarily know, but I learned very quickly in that pivot was be aware that when you come into a new situation, there are perceptions. People will have perceptions of you. And it, it you just have to be open, honest, and sincere and sincerely listen to figure those out. And then once you figure those out, now all of a sudden you've got the recipe. If you're if you're mindful about it, you've got the recipe to make the pivot appropriately. You've got the recipe to bring down those walls, change those perceptions, get yourself brought in as part of the collective team. Again, remind yourself that if you come in as a manager in a new position, you don't have the right to lead yet. You have to earn that. Just because you have the title doesn't mean that you roll in and go, and we're now going to do these 42 things just like this, right? You don't have that. I mean, those are the pieces that I kind of learned. I think I did. Most of it okay in this case. The hardest bit for me was just really getting my head around the perceptions that were there to try and go figure that out. Um, you know, for the first few months, you kind of play a role uh, and then you kind of evolve yourself into some, being something more of a team lead. I had a team that I managed, but I was part of the leadership team for responsible AI. And it took me a couple months of listening and feeling out and understanding what my role is going to be to start with, but then basically going in and demonstrating that I deserve the right to be part of that virtual leadership team. So those are the things that I kind of put into it. And I think you can apply that to any kind of a cultural transition transition or cultural awareness, really knowing your strengths and being self-aware and really picking up the perceptions of the people who are around you. 
So I want to I want to dive a little more into that, and I want to point out that we'll I'll probably want to have you back on to spend a lot more time on AI because we're already like 50 minutes into this, and I don't want to take your entire day because you probably have to provide rewards for your your team. And, and, this and people, here, we've spent 55 minutes already, and it feels like six. It it doesn't in my uh, in my cooking channel. I made a 47 minute brisket video. I had a friend say, "Can you make a 20 minute video on how to you know make a bowl of cereal?" I'm like, "Yeah, probably. I probably could." But uh, the cultural point, when I, I bring this up because when I started working uh, with my most recent previous company, uh, who had a dev center in India, I was shocked early on because I was thanking people for getting me information. Senior people, senior members of the team, really bright folks, right? But I was I was the new guy, um, and the thank you was seen as insincere, right? Because it was too effusive. The the people on the other side, uh, in this case, a, a dear friend named Deepak, was like, this is my job, right? Now, where I really screwed this up was I didn't realize it at the time. Like, so you have to fast forward some number of months. And when 12 of them come together, that becomes a year. And then it gets really dodgy. Um, because I used to say, I don't thank the light for turning on when I flip a switch. Right, because I would get really annoyed when the the just basic functions were not working or not being done, and yet here he had expressed a year or a year and a half prior the fact that me thanking him for the sort of perfunctory things he was doing, he felt was he was actually insincere, and so it chipped away at something that we've talked about intentionally, which is trust and authenticity. It wasn't simply odd to him; it wasn't simply out of place to him. It made him question my intentions, right? Have you seen that? And I'm happy to speaking of, of, of folks in India, but this could be true of any culture. I, I haven't worked extensively with folks in China or Japan or, or any the UK. I mean, Brits are a pain in the ass anyway. I'm just kidding. I love I love my British friends, but they're they're essentially just us with an accent and uh, and you know ten IQ points higher by default. So, have you experienced this elsewhere? Um, Other than the Brit thing. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking back to my Brit team. Um, so I have, you know, one of my big, and you've known me for a long time, Dee, um, I lead with a lot of energy. And I, I used to joke with people that, and this sounds egomaniacal, it's not meant to be, it's just a bad analogy, which is, it can be kind of like the sun. When kept at the appropriate distance, it actually gives life, but too close and it destroys things. And, and so when I've incurred or when I've encountered folks from cultures where, and from any kind of cultural background, it may not even necessarily be a nationality representation, just even a personality perspective of somebody who's a deep intro introvert, very quiet, they think to speak, you know, I work at a high rate, I work at a high energy type of pieces, as you very well know. Um, I've had people who've really struggled with that, right? Those kind of differences, those kind of gaps where there was just a mismatch in how we were doing work, how I was versus how they were. Um, and, and, you know, I would have people who would just go dark because they didn't think there was air in the room, you know, in a back when we got in offices, right, before we were all remote uh, and you're around a whiteboard. And, you know, it, it took a lot of learning and awareness for me in those type of cultural instances. And again, some of them are more personality traits, not necessarily truly cultural, but they're still, yeah. behavior, they're still behavioral in nature to kind of get that awareness. And one of the things I committed to try and do was make sure that I adapted to them. And this was, this I'm snark, right? I used to resent the fact that we would have incredibly senior leaders at our previous employees who I felt like I had to manage. I'm like, that dude makes seven figures a year easy and I don't, but I'm expected to manage him. BS, he should have to manage me. Like I should be crazy and wild and out of control and he should have to be managing the room and making sure that I'm, you know, like he gets paid more. Why doesn't he have to do this? And so I always internalize that, that I'm like, as I become a senior leader, I don't want to be that guy. Right. Um, and so, you know, one of the things and when I get into cultural situations like that, again, whether it be kind of a nationalistic, whether it be personality based, whatever, I try and go make sure I get a sense for what those characteristics are. And I try and be really conscious about how I adapt to them. And don't try and force them to adapt to me, even though my default action may be rah, at a thousand miles an hour with high volume and high energy and rah rah, right? Um, I don't know that I've encouraged a lot, or have encountered a lot of those cultural differences that are more nationalistic. And again, if I did, I think I'd be overgeneralizing. I don't want to do that, right? 
Um, so I, I kind of back it off to more behavioral cultural issues, something based on how they're raised or where they were raised at or something like that. They, they gave them some kind of a personality. Um, but uh, th that's kind of an example that comes to mind off mm -hmm. the top of my mind anyway. Yeah, and I, and I think that the the way you summed it up is solid. I think that it just get, it can get amplified sometimes uh, by geographic differences, uh, sometimes religious differences, right? I mean, I in my last in my last job, getting a chance to travel to India and become more immersed in the culture there was fantastic. I learned an immense amount about how to adapt, how to be more aware and mindful of people's perception of you and their reactions. I it. It took me a solid year to get my team to understand that when I, I remember I, I said at a company meeting when I had taken over the team more or less uh, about us moving forward and, and the things we had intended to do. These were all aspirational goals. Here's what we're going to do. And we'd love everyone here to be part of that. But if for some reason we're not able to give you what you're looking for, if we can't provide you the opportunity that you're looking for, the exposure that you're looking for, the culture that you're looking for, whatever it is, let us know and we'll help you find someplace else to be successful if we can't do it if we fail because that make no mistake that's likely a failure of our part right then we'll help you find someplace else because in life there aren't just vectors that run like this right because if you go off and do great things we could get back together right because you've gone and 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 had the experiences you wanted and you can come back and teach us what we didn't know and when i said it the first time i got overwhelming feedback that it was received poorly yeah. Right. That it was essentially, well, if you don't like it here, pound sand. Yeah, right. I and it wasn't. It, it, I, I had spent so much time making sure to soften the message and be very clear and be supportive. But what was funny is if I fast forwarded, and I don't know how many months my friends in, in India, my former colleagues will probably message me and say, no, it wasn't six months. It was 12 months or whatever. At some point they realized that, that it was genuine. It was never meant as a slight. It was never meant of it's my way or the highway. It was always meant as our goal is to create something special with you. And if we're not able to find something that you find special too, then our next goal is to make you happy somewhere else in so much as we are capable of doing so. Because that's just the right thing to do. It is trivially true that that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Trust takes time, right? If you yeah. want a nice alliteration for it. And I think, you know, back, back to my transition to United Health Group, as well as my move here to Ford, I think those are things that I've continued to be aware of. Like for the first couple of months, listen a lot, ask very open, sincere questions, you know, try and go build those relationships so that there, there's an awareness that they now know you. They think they know you when they get in the door. Oh, mm -hmm. I know this guy or this girl yeah. or whoever it is. And I know these things about them. That's why I said earlier, it's about really figuring those perceptions out and then spending the time to do that. One last thing to pick up on that you said, you talked about the light switch, right? Hey, yep. look, nobody thanked the light switch for the lights for turning on when they turned the switch on. I'm paraphrasing, right? Yep. And then you go to the other side and you're overly thankful. Consistency also matters incredibly yep. because it's not what you say, it's what you do. And it's what you do consistently actually gets that point of of understanding trust and, and relationship building and so and i have to i have to be very aware of this because i can be very flip big surprise right mm. and so first of all people need to kind of know that about me and then not to take it personally and i'm doing it because one of my leadership principles is having fun i literally ask each of my directs at the end of every one-on-one -on -one, okay so you still having fun i'm doing a check-in and knows an acceptable answer you just have to tell me so we can talk about it sure I do the same thing with my when, with coaching at the university, so they get that. But it takes time. Like you can't roll in on day one and be a semi bad comedian, because um, then people will actually build their own judgments. It takes time to make that transition, and they need to know you as a person, and you need to be consistent. So I can see if you make a comment about nobody thank the light switch for turning lights on, and then follow that up with, "Gosh, thank you guys so much for giving this information." I can see where all of a sudden if people have an impression to start with. They're like. Yeah, when he came in with the delay stitch thing is what we were expecting. Now he's being nice. I don't believe it. What's funny is it's, I think, a astute observation. And while the timings weren't lined up like that, I can see that with the benefit of hindsight, looking at the two of them makes sense. Um, one of the differentiators between them is one of them was a reflection on human encounters and one is a technical observation. Right. One of the other things that we we built over time, and I was very proud of how we built it over time, and I'm sure you've built it with your teams, is right ideas win. I don't care who has the idea. I don't care if it's the person making seven figures, or the person making seven dollars. Right ideas win, and we are never angry at a person. We're angry at a problem. 
right? It is not personal. If it's personal, it's an H&R issue, right? That's a totally separate bucket, right? But generally speaking, if I was pissed in a meeting about a problem, right, it was the problem. It wasn't the person who wrote the code. It wasn't the person who did the architecture. I'm not mad at them as a human, right? I used to joke all the time. I was like, listen, I'm sure so-and-so is a nice person. They don't kick puppies, but this function sucks, right? And we have to figure out why it sucks. Why did we make that mistake? Um, it is hard for people uh, to separate those things, right? And, o- and only with the evolving uh, nature of emotional intelligence do you realize that. And for people who do separate them, and I'm not saying it's a superpower or you're better than anyone else, but if you do that naturally, it is vexing to not see it from others because, and this is where I think sometimes my wife, you know, you mentioned your wife, Lisa, I'll mention my wife, Elena. I get in trouble more often than not. In fact, I think probably upwards of 95% just because of tone tone that I am completely unaware of. And she knows it. And we've been married for, I don't know, 750 years. And she still at time will go, listen, I don't know why you're using that tone with me. And I'm like, what tone? I don't even understand. Right. But that human side becomes such an issue. And you think about the dimensions of communication, right? The words you choose, the tone you use, the pace you use, right? All of these things uh, factor into to leading teams. Yes. Now, so, Lisa, so that makes Lisa and I married for 800 years. So just to be clear. Yeah, that's right. You, you, you guys predated us, right? <laughs> yeah. But it, it, and then magnify that where you have two communications majors in the same house. It's a very interesting thing. Um, one last thing on consistency. And I know you want to kind of jump forward to some other topics. Um, sure. Remember confirmation bias. The oh, yeah. people who work with you are looking for you to exhibit what they think you are. And so even if you do something 99 times, And then you do something else one time. And that one time lines up with what their impression or perception of you is. Guess what? The one win. (laughs) Um, And so it's it's super important. And I learned this actually being a high school teacher. That was one of the first things they taught us. And this is why, again, I joke, there's not a whole lot of difference between being a high school teacher and being a manager or leader in corporate America. Um, It's pay. Like that's the only difference. Yeah, pay pay uh, is certainly one. Yeah. And, and so, but consistency is super important because students will see right through it. And if they, for them, it's less about knowing your personality and it's more about opportunity. Like, you know, if I find you behaving this way or I can find a, you know, a crack or a flaw here, I can go, I can manipulate it because high school kids are well manipulative. I'm sure Nick isn't, but the rest are right. (laughs) Um, And so, so consistency really, really, really matters. And that's another bug I have to watch. I have to be very, very careful because I can, I'm pretty dynamic. I can go lots of directions at a time, but but in important moments, it's important for me to be consistent. Yeah, I think consistency is a great point. Um, and and I do. I, I it's funny. We could talk for days, and we have in fact spoken for days uh, over over our relationship. <laughs> um, and you were smarter than I was, and you got a bigger coffee. I'm almost at the end of my coffee. Um, but I, I want to talk to some tech stuff as well. And, you know, I had in my head this going about an hour and a half. And that, that was where I'd thrown a dart at the wall. So I kind of figured that's what it'd be. And it's, I think we're on track for that. But uh, hopefully you're having a good time and you'll come back and do this again, because I'm sure as hell enjoying it even more wow. than I thought I would. And I went in thinking I was going to like this. So, <laughs> dude, this is like a Sunday morning for you and I. This is you and it, I. It is. Coffee, except for the fact you're indoors, not out on the kitchen. So, yeah. Yeah. Though I was out there this morning. I, I, I joke earlier you know i got the the my gravity feed cooker is up too let me check because of course as a technologist i have it on my phone just like all of the old cookers you know all the old pit masters do um it's up to 156 degrees now i need to get to 250 it was very cold here for florida norms in the 50s yeah exactly uh at any rate let's talk some tech because we do have a background in tech and i think tech is a really interesting backdrop but i'm going to talk around innovation and strategy because of the changes you've gone through right You've been sort of at the forefront of a number of different technology areas. Um, can you talk about a project or a specific initiative that you're really, really proud of? Something that's got you got your tech juices flowing? Because we can get really juiced up about interpersonal relationships and, and leadership dynamics and team dynamics, but we also can get pretty juiced about technology. Yeah. So, so I'm going to do a 30 because you have two different things there. One's innovation and one strategy, right? They're, oh, that's they're, true. They're very different. I'm going to do a quick cover on the strategy one and then jump to innovation. So on the strategy one, that's easy. That was the journey you and I were on to try and go resuscitate a product called Systems Management Server 2.0. 
that is literally the proudest moment in my professional life is the work that we did to go not only make the right fixing the product was actually the easy part right um getting buy-in and trust back from our customers our field our partners and then figuring out how we now were behind in a marketplace to play catch up and then go from that particular position of weakness to a $900 million a year business. The, the things that we did out of that, I could spend hours talking about. That's actually one of my favorite interview answers is to talk about that particular move and, and being a co-leader through that. I didn't manage the teams through that, but I will, I will account for being a good piece of the energy through that. There were a handful of us that, that obviously had big roles in that. Um, but I mean, the decisions were crazy. We invented the first ever feature pack at Microsoft as a way to get features out quickly because normal ship cycles were three, four, five years. And we could literally go build a platform that we could add features on top of and do yearly updates to go keep our customers interested to continue to do things. You know, the fact that Brady and I stood on stage and showed bug counts to our customers to go demonstrate quality improvements on the product. And then we took the fact that we built infrastructure to track our bugs and improve our logging and use it as a competitive differentiator against the in-market products. Like we did so many crazy strategic things there to go hold the market at bay, take care of our customers, which was our number one goal, and be able to move things forward until we shipped a product literally five years later um, that put us back in the leadership position, leveraging our partners to go filling gaps. And it was, it was a crazy journey um, of technology work, um, platform work, customer work, all kinds of crazy stuff that, that was, a, the, to me, from a strategy perspective, is, is, should be a book. We, more books. I know you're working on a book. I need books. I gotta write books. That, anyway. that definitely needs to be a book. And it's funny because they had the, some reunion a couple of years ago. I was down at a conference in South Florida and I saw some Twitter activity from Brad and David James and a couple of other people. And apparently they had some sort of a get together at what is now MMS. Uh, which was the management summit. And it was like a reunion of sorts. And I still, uh, you know, I, this is probably for the folks listening, whoever, I, this is new. So there may be just, you know, our wives listening to this at some point. Um, but uh, but th it is one of the more proud moments that I can think of the work that we did there. And I'm still incredibly uh, flattered with the people that I stay in touch. I saw Renee not four months ago. Um, and, you know, just people that we worked with 20 something years ago that yeah, when yeah. I see David James, it's like you, it's like we never stopped working together. Right. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, before I left Microsoft, they, I, I had left the team, but they actually did a 25 year reunion of the first release of SMS 1.0, which would have been 2017. I think if I get my, my memory, right. I think it was 92 was when SMS 1.0 dropped and some things like that. So, yeah, so there were definitely some opportunities there. Re revisit some videos and all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyway, so I'm going to get to the innovation side. This, sure. is, whole, this is totally indulgent by the way. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as, as D alluded to, I've been for the past, I don't know, five, six years, pivoted from, well, actually the past 10 plus years, pivoted from really commercial software development to um, data engineering. Like, hey, building standard old boring Kimball pipelines with ETL and SQL for double donut charts and Power BI and crazy stuff, uh, which then moved into ML engineering and starting to spend a lot of time in ML AI. I even managed a data science team for a few years. And so, uh, and then, like I said, moved into a position in responsible AI, building systems for a crazy large company, United Health Group, Fortune 6, I think they are, um, trying to go build ways. For Couldn't them. quite crack that top five, huh? Yeah. Now, I remember the recruiter. She's like, <laughs> the recruiter is hysterical, and I still have a bunch of Microsoft pride. And she's like, well, Microsoft, is that a Fortune 10 company? You know, we're Fortune 6. And my answer was, no, ma'am, but they're in the Fortune 50, and they could actually buy you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, tone it down. Yeah. Um, everyone, everyone ease up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> Fortune so, six. It's crazy. Um, and, uh, approximately I, uh, and so AI has been this thing that I've been spending a lot of time. My current job doesn't afford me that luxury, but it's still my side hustle. And so one of the things D mentioned is, is that I coach and mentor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in the Jeff Rake School of Computer Science and, and Management. It's basically an entrepreneurial school for eggheads to go through and take comp sci plus business marketing management with the with the goal to literally the, the president of the, of the program wants to go fit, have 50% of the kids actually go into entrepreneurial work. 
He really wants them into startup and kind of doing these things. Um, they have the equivalent of what they call a cap, what they call design studio. Think of it as a capstone. So each of the teams, junior and senior year, have to go do a cool project. In most cases, those are funded by local businesses. So somebody like Mutual of Omaha will go say, I'm giving you X dollars for a team of smart kids to go build a cool solution for me. Um, they're taking some of those and incubating them as startup ideas. So Segway, mm -hmm. I wanted to give everybody context of what I do. Segway, the project I'm working with for the second year is a project called Dyslexico. And I'll get Derek the URL to put in there. Um, it is crazy cool. The premise is this, uh, for the 10% of the people listening to this who have dyslexia, because that's what the statistics indicate, about 10% of folks have some gradient form of dyslexia. Uh, their text editing experiences are suboptimal. Like if you go into Word or you go into Google Docs or even your favorite email editor or your phone, <clears throat> the amazing autocorrect and spell check and grammar check that we've built in as a commodity into those is great for non-dyslexic patterns. For people with dyslexia, not only is it inaccurate, but in many cases, it makes it worse. It either misses a bunch of words to correct, like it doesn't handle homonyms well, and dyslexic thinkers use, use uh, um, God, I'm forgetting the word. Uh, you know, they, they, they use, the way the word sounds is the way to go generate the spelling, right? I'm a, oh, phonetics. Yes, they use phonetics. Thank you. Sorry, my coffee hasn't kicked in yet. Yeah, they use phonetics a lot. And so they're the victims of homonyms, as an example. Sure. It's like it also isn't constrained to a word. It's phrases in a, it's words in a phrase, phrase, words in a sentence. And so some spell checks will just check out. <sighs> Too hard for me. Like they throw their hands up and quit. Huh. Um, so this, this team, who the dev lead is dyslexic and her little sister is more dyslexic, said, you know what? I'm going to use my knowledge in ML, lever leveraging large language models as a way to try and build a better spell check grammar check for people who suffer from dyslexia. So this is my side hustle. I'm the coach for a team for the second year going through this technical and business journey. And it's, it's amazing to go see what you can do with artificial intelligence to solve a real world impactful problem. Um, it's crazy how hard it is, uh, especially with the human language as for, you talked about cultural awareness doing natural language processing for a while in the space of AI has made me so aware of how horrible the English language is and so empathetic <laughs> for any human being I who has to, learn to, it. has to pick it up as a second language. Oh my yeah. God. I used to think it was bad just with the I before E rule, right? It's exponentially worse than that. Uh, but so now all of a sudden trying to go train the model for accuracy and correctness trying to go build an experience, also coaching them to make sure that the thing doesn't turn into Microsoft Tay. For those of you who are not AI historians, Tay was an offer from Microsoft that was out for 24 hours. There was a precursor in 2015 to what you now know of as ChatGPT that literally was a text-based interaction tool and it was trained on the internet. And so somebody came in and said, wow, I'm Islamic. And it said, wow, you must be a terrorist and a murderer. And fortunately, that only lasted 24 hours. But I mean, trying to go think about what bias and what kind of misbehaviors language as a as an AI solution can actually run into, depending on how you train it and constrain it. Uh, but it's just crazy that a 20 year old knocks this out in her free time, kicks it out as an idea with her V1 of just being able to go prove that this model could be built. And then they go start this thing up and they've now been going into pitch competitions. They got $10,000 the other day from a local thing. They're applying for a million dollar grant. They're trying to go by the end of the school year, become a startup. But I mean, it, it's incredible. And I'm, I'm an AI zealot. So the people who hate it, like I know all the words. I reviewed over a thousand ML models over the course of a year at my time at United Health Group. Um, for responsibility. Trust me, I know every place it can misbehave. And I really want people to go take away the fact that 90% of the time, it's amazing and brilliant and valuable. 70% um, of the time, it's harmless. It's being used in automation scenarios that aren't going to go disadvantage me based on race, gender, or, you know, the kind of standard demographics or social determinant of health characteristics. The vast majority of the things that we look at are benign. It's simple things like, hey, I built a predictive model that's going to go look at my services logs to give me a better idea when I might be leading toward an outage so that I can actually not get caught off guard. I can have my services teams ready. I can proactively fix it so my customers don't get downtime. Like, there's zero risk to that. Like, I get it wrong. Oh, boy, we suffer some downtime again. Um, but it's just crazy to go see the potential of it. It's crazy to see how people of all ages can grasp this. 
This is not 30 year software engineers like you and I, in many cases, this is 20 year olds who are picking this up. One of the students at the Rake School, not on my team, uh, on another team, literally just won part of a $700,000 prize that was being offered to students to use ML as a way to go parse through the layers in the vellum scrolls from Vesuvius in Pompeii to be able to try and read them. So these things have been encased in bad volcanic stuff for thousands of years, right? This was literally the turn of the millennium. Um, and uh, and they, they can't they can't pull them apart. And if they take them out of the volcanic stuff, vellum's very weak. It will just disintegrate, right? So they're literally doing video to get through and kind of look at the different pieces, but they need ML to go identify the layering as a way to go do that. And he was actually the first one to get a word out of it. The word was purple, funny enough. It was Greek for purple. And then that got him 40K. And now on top of that, there are three of them who have actually identified 150 words. And so they shared the grand prize of 700K. This is a 20 year old, 21 year old that's doing this, using machine learning to go do really good stuff. Like this is the, the crazy thing. I transitioned to Ford because there's a bunch of folks that I know that work there and it's a really fun challenge and problem to solve in the Model E space. But I kind of miss it. I kind of miss my, my AI as my primary. In fact, I'm speaking, for those of you listening, I'm speaking, at the, <laughs> I'm speaking at the local Nebraska Data Users Conference next week on Responsible AI. So I, I've seen the post on LinkedIn and definitely do get me the URL and I'll put it into the uh, the YouTube uh, video version of this. This is hosted on Spotify, amongst others, uh, as an audio only podcast. Uh, so if you want to actually articulate the URL, uh, then people listening can can get it. I, I did a quick uh, Bing search. It wasn't Bing. Um, uh, <laughs> And I couldn't find it, but I found a bunch of interesting things. It was not listed as easily as I thought it would be under Dyslexico, but maybe it's some cool name. I don't know. So the URL is actually, and it's bad. I told the kids this, but it's too late. The horse is out of the barn. <laughs> dyslexa.co. I'm like, that's just so many people just end at .com. They're going to make it a dyslexa.com. It's going to autocorrect. Nobody knows .co is a domain name. What are you guys doing? And they just did it. Again, going back to our earlier commentary that even as a coach, I have zero, zero command, right? I can influence. Yeah. I can say things like, I'd really encourage you to go think about this and think about the consequences here. And why don't you guys go away and think about this? And then they're 20 year olds. They're going to go do whatever they're going to do. They thought dyslexia.co was cute. <laughs> uh, it is. It is cute. And I think all of these vanity domains are fascinating and someday we'll use them. Um, so it is dyslexia with an A, not an I, dyslexia.co. Dyslexia. Dyslexia. Yeah, I. Yeah. So this is the challenge with the language. But um, while we're on this topic, and I, I'm actually going to lay the URL in here in a second because I can do that with this incredibly cool tool that I'm using. Um, let's let's stay on the technology thing, and you can stay with AI and ML. Like I said, we're going to end up doing a lot more about this because it is a passion project for me too. I do feel like some of us who are technologists of the old days sound like luddites at times when we act afraid of the burgeoning technology of artificial intelligence and blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, guys. And, and listen, I listen to some really smart folks and there are some really smart folks afraid of what could happen. And it's what could happen, not what has happened in most cases, right? And there's a strong difference between AI and AGI, which is artificial general intelligence and all this sort of stuff, right? Um, Just don't say but, sentient. We talked about that. We, I get it. Right. And what's funny, my, my son, my younger son, Drew, who's 11, and I watch a, a show on YouTube called The Y Files. Guy's really good on camera. He talks about all sorts of conspiracies. And the setup is he sets up the conspiracy, gives you all of the, the, the proof of the conspiracy, and then he gives you the counter to it. And then he lets you kind of make your call. He's, I don't know where his training was from, but he's very good. It's a good show. And most recently, they were talking about how AI took over and became alive and all sorts of magical stuff. But at any rate, um, with regards to technology, what do you see as the future? What's the next uh, one, three, five years uh, in from your perspective that's going to be interesting uh, that people should be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. I don't have anything. I'm not going to aha anybody by this, right? I think we are just square in the crosshairs of the AI wave. And, and that's going to be the next three to five years, getting it stable, um, getting it predictable, finding uses, building trust, 
you know, all of these types of things. Because you're right, there's a lot of speculation. Not a speculation, I don't think speculation, fear. It's probably fear. But we all remember this. Not that I've actually gone to Google.com, but when search engines became the norm, like teachers freaked out. Like, oh my gosh, my kids are D-Y. Do you know how to spell dyslexia? D-Y. No, I don't. I don't, apparently. And I've spelled it wrong twice now. D-Y. Yeah. L-E-X-I dot co. No, I got it right. Shut up. Uh, it, it, that's and what's There's funny a, is, but but before you go into the next thing, I, I got so sidetracked on the other point, and then you know, with my own ineptitude with spelling, I wouldn't even have known this was a problem to solve, right? Yeah. And I think that that's oftentimes the thing we have to start with is like the number of people impacted by this and how significant it would be for folks. The fact that there is a tool to make that better, it's like holy crap! I had no yeah. idea. And the problem is, is that so people who are who specialize in uh, in trying to go educate people with neurodivergent, you know, conditions yep. like dyslexia, they get it. Um, even dyslexics don't get it. They just think that it's their problem. They honestly internalize it as, as their own problem because they've struggled through this since they were most likely kids. Um, they fight through. There's amazing research about uh, dyslexia or dyslexics and innovation. Like if you take some of the top entrepreneurs and richest people in the world, AKA Richard Branson and others, they're yep. heavily dyslexic, right? And there's the, the there's this belief that the struggle and the thought patterns that you have to go through to kind of counteract the natural tendencies of your brain uh, make people entrepreneurial. They make them have new ways of solving problems. Anyway, but you're right. It's it, even, even people who are dyslexic don't necessarily know they have a problem with it because they've not seen what the alternative is. Right, uh, right, right. And, and so it's it's great. We talk to educators at, at dyslexic specialist schools like the Armstrong School in San Francisco, and they totally get it. And they look at this and go, oh, my gosh, this could be game changing. If you do have dyslexia, public service announcement, you can go to this URL. It's in beta and it's free. All you do is you take your text, you put it in there, and it will actually give you recommended corrections using the ML pattern, specifically trained on dyslexic text, uh, to try and give you a richer experience. And then you can copy and paste that back into your document and, and send it in, whether it's your email, whether it's your Google Doc or your Word Doc or what have you. The team is actually working on natural plugins into those into those surface areas so you can actually get correction where you work. So stay right. tuned. Very cool. Yep. Very, very so cool. Anyway, All right, so now we can hop back to the one, three, five years. Yeah, I, it's just going to be the AI wave for the next three to next foreseeable future. Uh, it's going to go through the battle of regulation versus innovation. Um, you know, do we go fast? Do we go slow? This is interesting, though. Um, if the folks out there know anything about this thing called GDPR, which is a the general data protection rights as passed by the European Union in 2018. Um, there was no care for business. All we care about is the end user and the end user needs to have rights to know what's collected and right to delete it, view it and export it. Full stop. Businesses, if this costs you a fulfillion dollars, sorry. <laughs> uh, responsible AI is kind of interesting. Uh, if you take a look at the early work from the EU when they were building their, their legislation, it explicitly said we're only gonna address high risk AI. And we're trying to balance responsible AI to make sure that we don't do something that neuters a business industry because they didn't want to be out in front with legislation that took European businesses and made them non-competitive in right. the space of AI. So they've had to be very balanced about it. I believe the United States is going to be the same. I'm applauding the U.S. for the executive order they passed this fall, although it's very general. It's cushy and fluffy and not a lot of details in it. Um, they just implemented the AI safety board this week, which will be a step in the right direction. We'll now have a group dedicated to tracking and building legislation around, around uh, safe and responsible AI. States are picking it up. State of New York now actually has uh, legislation relative to hiring. If you're using AI in your hiring practices, this is all Amazon's fault. I, there are canonical <laughs> examples of failures in AI that, that set these examples. Amazon built an ML model to try and go look at resumes and predict who they thought was going to be the most successful Amazon employee. And it was amazing at picking 40 year old males <laughs> be because they, because they trained it on historical data and the high right. performers, especially in the tech industry are 75 to 80% male. And so all ML that's trained on history will relive history, right? Which is crazy. Yep. We have the quote that says those who forget history are forever deemed to relive it. Well, ML does that at scale at speed 
and accuracy. Like if you want to go relive history for everybody really fast, go build an ML model trained on purely historical data and it will do it crazy well. Like you and I used to joke about this in our previous product, which distributed software and our customers would talk to yeah. us about, well, I distributed this piece of software and it didn't install right on the system. Or we're like, well, but you packaged it. The yeah. bits that we delivered, they executed the way you wanted them to, right? Well, yeah, well, we can't fix your bugs. Yeah. We're like the post office. We just get it there. We didn't package it for you. We just get it to the right address most of the time. So It's, it's uh, not the tool. It's the tool using the tool. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, there, there's no newness. I mean, in the, in the, in the EV space, there's interesting news. Uh, cool. Yesterday, GM and Honda announced that they may be scrapping their EV plans and going full hydrogen. So I do think there's going to be innovations in the space of, yeah, serious. I, I make this full problem. hydrogen? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know that it's full. Again, back to our commentary about binary, it's more gradient. Um, but I think there's going to be crazy things in the low to no carbon emission space for powering vehicles um, as far as whether that is true EV. And if so, like there was something came out yesterday, the batteries that can charge in 10 minutes, you know, so they're looking to try all of these pieces are crazy. And none of us are 130 years old, although we feel like it, but we don't necessarily remember what it took to go bring the first internal combustion engine to market in the early you know, in the early 1900s, as far as gas stations and infrastructure and cost and fill up and all kinds of things. But we're reliving that in the EV space now, too. Like, you know, you've charging anxiety and, you know, with the latest cold front doesn't apply to Florida. But in Chicago, Tesla's chargers were shutting down because they're looking for a certain temperature on the vehicle before they'll actually initiate charge. And so, I mean, I think there's going to be some crazy stuff in that space relative to trying to find a way to go build mainstream gasoline powered things not running on gasoline um, you know what would make it easier is to now pivot once again to another set of infrastructure that we need to get out there like hydrogen but hydrogen i think you can do it so your infrastructure is water that hasn't been particularly successful I, but you know all of none of these things are particularly successful you're just listen i've been it. driving an electric car since 2016 and it's been successful from the day i got in it i have had no problem with charging Right now, I, I get it. Batteries are dirty, and that's a problem, but that is an imminently solvable problem. We yeah. just have to apply enough interest to it. Um, and then the availability, hell, I mean, not, not to get into a debate about Elon Musk, but one of his most brilliant moves was creating the largest unregulated utility in the country, which is a supercharger network. Brilliant, right? And he has the right to wheeling charges and all the other stuff. He's got the country by the short and curlies. But they're going to put one at the Wawa down the street. <laughs> so I don't know. You're in a really neat space, man. You know me. I'm a, I'm a bit of a zealot when it comes to EVs. I've had three different ones, and we've had uh, we've had hybrid Priuses. I, I'm a huge fan. So more more tech is more better, as yeah, I say. I definitely think there's going to there's gonna be more more work that goes in that space. But yeah, in the in the traditional tech space, it just uh, plan on riding the AI wave, and let's go see what. Let's go see what the collision of regulation and AI looks like. Let's go see what the fruition looks like of AI replacing jobs, the big fear that everyone has. Um, what I think that's interesting, honestly, is that when I look at the jobs that are out there, everyone always thought that AI was going to replace blue collar workers. Guess what? Every truck driver and cab driver out of a job. We're going to have all automated cars. And we know that that's actually a tough nut to crack. Um, what I'm actually seeing more and more of is middle level white collar jobs. Especially Absolutely. If you, take, you take our beloved, we were, I think we were chatting about this the other day. You take our beloved friend chat GPT. Oh, we all love chat GPT, right? Which at its core is using a large language model to be able to translate text or to do things with text. It takes text in, it spits text out. Overly generalized, but that's what it does. There's an entire industry in healthcare and legal that do nothing more than translating from what a patient or a customer says or thinks into the language of the profession. Um, when I was at United Health Group, literally within X months of ChatGPT being released, we had 60 or seven pilot projects, 60 or 70 pilot projects looking at different areas. And honestly, it's less about replacing people and it's more about being responsive to customers. Right now, there's such a backlog of information that's just sitting around. I mean, there's just literally exabytes of data that's just sitting around that they haven't gotten translated yet into something that could become actionable, that could train models to do better disease prediction, or that frankly could just be more responsive to the customer that says, hey, guess what? Your lab results are back today. Here's what they mean, and here's what the doctor recommends that you should actually do. 
Should it prescribe what the doctor does? Maybe, but maybe it's just a quick, more responsive translation from my doctor's you know, medical ease into something that I can get quickly that saves he and his nurse the time of delivering it and therefore increases my, my service, right? I mean, there are all of these potentials. And so I think that's going to be the next few years. We're going to kick the tires in places we never thought it was going to solve things. We're going to learn to trust it. It's going to stub its toe. So we're going to learn to untrust it and then retrust it. Uh, and then there's going to be this big collision of regulation on top of it that says, you know, how much do we let it go and how much do we not let it go? And do we try and overregulate it or under? I do hope the United States takes the stance that Europe did that says, let's just go identify that there's high risk AI and let's start there. If there's if there's a piece of AI that has a potential negative outcome that could be bad to catastrophic. Let's start there. Let's make sure that's got the right set of guard, guardrails and processes to go through. Uh, but beyond that, that 70% of the AI that's honestly really pretty benign and just simple automation tasks, let's not overregulate it. Let's let that go fast like crazy. It's it's not dissimilar in my head, though I don't spend the time you do in, you know, embroiled in it. It's it's a world that you've lived in. I've only sat on the periphery and poked holes at it. Um, but as an EV driver, you know, I think that automation and driving is something that's something we could get too close. Florida Polytech down the street is one of the largest test beds for that yeah. in the country. And where we seem to really stub our toe, certainly the tech has problems from time to time. But generally speaking, a well-equipped vehicle driving via software is still almost imminently better than most humans driving. It doesn't accidentally have a, a stroke. It doesn't get drunk. It doesn't, you know, it, it just does its thing. And so the more tools driving themselves, the safer the roads would become. If we would get the hell out of the way and let them drive on their own, generally speaking, we could do all sorts of neat things, like have them speak to each other, right? Like how many times have you want to, I'm trying to get in here. You put in your turn signal, the guy speeds up. The control, the automatic driving tools would not do that. But when it comes to AI, one of the interesting things that I want to see happens is, a lot of this comes back to scale. And maybe this is just old guys sitting on the porch um, stuff, but no one used to care a thousand years ago. And for those of you who are not as old as I am, we used to have these things called cassettes. You'd record things on them. Uh, and uh, we would record songs on the radio and then we would play them again. And then people would make mixtapes where they would, <laughs> and I have to explain this because people don't even know what the hell this is anymore. And the music industry didn't give a shit because it didn't scale. Mm -hmm. And then Napster happened. And the world changed, right? Are, so when are you, are you saying that we illegally copied songs off of some medium to put on a cassette? Hmm, yes, Maybe. all the yeah. time. But, but we couldn't yeah. scale it, right? So you had the one guy who was selling them at the swap meet who got roused by a cop every once in a while, but you didn't have, you know, global litigation. Yeah. When the the litigation word is one of the things I want to get to here. One of the challenges we are going to face, and one of the challenges I think self-driving cars faces, humans like to have someone to blame if there's a problem. And they like that thing to be a person because the person usually has money, <laughs> right? And and so if if I can't blame a person, who do I blame? Now I can blame a company and they have more money. So if, 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 my, if my automatic driving car kills somebody, then I get really pissed and I can get a lot of money, right? But if my doctor is using AI to draw conclusions, to make a diagnosis, and it's wrong. If the doctor was wrong, it was just a person who made a mistake. He went to school for a thousand years. He did the best he could. Right? It's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how we as human animals allow grace to non-human processing and results. Well, it's... Right? Uh... I, but each, each one of those cases, the number one expense for a professional in the medical industry is malpractice. Insurance. Insurance. Right? You know, yep. so I mean, it, it's going to be, uh, there will be, there will be no grace regardless, whether it's a person or whether it's a machine. <clears throat> I think, I think human nature, the way we've evolved now, and I don't know that I'm always proud of it, is, is literally looking for, and it's not even accountability, like it's blame. And there's a difference between. Yes. Them. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm just looking for blame. I'm looking for a scapegoat. I'm looking for something that says it wasn't my fault. It's not that I'm looking for a person. I'm just looking for anything other than me. 
And so the AI is going to be no different, whether I'm blaming the person who did the task or the automation that did the task, I'm still going to go look for that. In fact, I might even be happier because I can blame a company and they're going to have bigger pockets and they're not a person. Like it's harder for me to blame my doctor who I have a relationship maybe for 15 to 20 years if they miss something versus, you know, blaming a, you know, computer algorithm that spits something at me that probably mm -hmm. had more precision and accuracy than the doctor did. Um, right. Making the decision, right? This is also right. why... When we had a risk framework, and I won't go into detail because I think it's proprietary to United Healthcare, but we had a way to go talk about classes of, of use cases, and they would fit into a risk framework. And so for a lot of these things, we would go mandate a human in the middle. So it would not be that the thing automatically generated something for me. It would be the thing generated a bunch of details for the physician to allow the physician to maybe see things they didn't see through the normal data that came in, leveraging what they would normally do is go through their institutional knowledge or a, a beta database of things and look pieces up. This is just providing it all at scale and at speed for them to try and make a better decision um, types of pieces. And that's where it's all going to start. Like It's all going to yep. start as just a better... <clears throat> data collection and predictive model on a scale of data that no human could actually get their head around at a speed that no human could actually go execute at, and then allow that sage physician to go make a de decision about whether I'm gonna go prescribe this regimen or whether I'm gonna tell you, hey, look, you probably just have a stomach illness, drink a Coke, right? Kind of thing, you know, some Midwest doc solution to things. Uh, and so those are, the, those are gonna be the tensions that are gonna be there. Um, and it's and it's going to keep going on the car side. You know what's interesting. Your point is valid, and it's validated by the insurance companies. Insurance companies are heavily encouraging users, when available, to use adaptive adaptive controls in their vehicle. Absolutely. Whether, whether it's whether it's ours, which is Blue Cruise, whether it's Chevy's implementation, they know that those things are true. They know that those things are real. That a person who does that just invariably simple things like lane correction distracted yep. distracted driving is the number one cause of accidents and those types of things absolve 80 to 90 percent of the distracted driving problems our implementation interesting recognized by consumer retort reports is the best in the market um, <laughs> makes you focus on the road like we're the only one that really has a dash cam that's looking at your eyes and if you veer off of that for x amount of time <clears throat> you'll be coached to look back at the road again you don't have to mercedes have does that do they Ours must be better. Consumer Reports likes us. They're probably better. There, than there's a lot more. There's a lot more of yours. Uh, yeah. I would say. Come on. But, but I mean, that, it's a, it's a but you're absolutely right, though. I can't put a weight on the wheel, right? For anyone who's had a Tesla and put a, a cell phone holder on the wheel. And I, I remember pulling through a drive through and the guy saying, what, the screen in the middle is not big enough? And I'm like, no, it is. But if my cell phone is in this holder, it simulates the one point whatever pounds pressure I need to have on the wheel so that Tesla will just drive. Yep. Right. It wasn't eyes. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. So it's a uh, uh, it's a crazy distinction. And so as we one of the things that I'm working on for is we get a chance to build relationships with the insurance companies and they're continuing to give us information and feedback. They're like, we love automated driving solutions. But as an end user, this is one of the things it's like scary there. You can go do again, do a Bing search on YouTube <laughs> for um, for videos for testing automated driving. It's crazy funny to go watch people the first time that they take their hands off of the wheel. It's funny. There's a trust issue that's just horrible. Like when we got Lisa's new car, we almost thought about waiting for next year's Explorer because it has Blue Cruise on it. She's like, I wouldn't use it anyway. I'm like, honey, we drive to Georgia like four times a year. That's 1,200 miles you wouldn't have to think with the exception of Atlanta and Chattanooga. You wouldn't use it through the mountains in Chattanooga. But, um, but like 99% of the drive, you could just be staring at the road and hands relaxed and we could be chatting as long as you're looking at the road and with no more than like, I think it's a second or a second and a half deviation, right? Um, it's crazy beneficial. My boss decided he owns some property in upstate New York. He decided to go take a Blue Cruise vehicle and drive from Seattle to New York and back. He literally put almost 10,000 miles of blue cruise miles on his vehicle. He says it was life changing. He says it used to be my wife and I would have to switch off every three, four hours, mm -hmm. drive, driver fatigue. He says it's all interstate and it's all blue cruise enabled, which basically means it's dual lane roads. You know, you've got or divided highway, dual lane, X number of road markers, Y number of things. You can't use it in construction. There's some rules about it, but he said like 95% of where they were at was all blue cruise. He says, I was, he says, I was completely fine. I just sat there in the chair for eight hours 
and we drove. We got out for lunch, filled up with gas, got back in. I drove the other four hours, no driver fatigue. And literally it changes lanes for you. As long as you just hit the turn signal, it'll move for you. You hit the turn signal, it'll move back. Literally that's all you do. It just stays between the white and the yellow um, mm -hmm. and goes. And, and he says, you know, now we're one step short of, hey, look, if I put GPS in that now, does it need to know where I go and I don't have to go tell it? Now all of a sudden you really get the level three automation when you kind of break through that piece. But, um, but it's crazy and it's crazy empowering if you trust it. Oh, look, there's that trust yeah. word. Yeah. No, it's funny. Uh, with my my first Tesla going to Miami, 85% of the trip, maybe 90, was in cruise. And then I got, I was one of the early adopters for the, the next level that had GPS. So as long as you were getting on the interstate, interstate and staying on the interstate, it would follow your GPS, which was fantastic. And it did the lane changing stuff. Then they changed it. The next rev, you had to pay for automated self-driving, which was another big chunk of change or whatever. But no, listen, I think that the future is exciting for that sort of stuff. And I think it it will be, we have plenty of other topics that we can cover. We're, we're at 139 now. I should probably let you get back to rewarding your 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 team. Um, are there any projects or any last words you want to give to our folks who are listening to Plain Spoken here today? Uh, thanks. Thanks for letting Derek and I be indulgent. Um, I hope that around us just being great friends and talking about crazy stuff that we would normally talk about on a Sunday morning, I hope that there's some things you can take away from this. Like I said, I don't know all the answers. I've learned a lot. I have lots of scars. I joke about the fact that I have a PhD from the University of Hard Knocks, right? And in those particular pieces, um, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about sincerity and trust. We talk a lot about self-awareness. I mean, for any piece of leadership, those are the key elements. You, nobody will follow you anywhere if they don't trust you. Like if there's a, if there's a simple piece, if they don't sincerely think you're sincere and don't trust you, think of behaviors in a foxhole, think of all of these types of behaviors over time. You cannot lead with hierarchy. You lead with sincerity and trust because people will follow you and they'll follow you through problems. They'll follow you regardless of hierarchy and they'll follow you through bad times. No, you can't manage through bad times. You have to lead through bad times. Well, I uh, I had a whole bunch of other stuff written to do a conclusion, but you just did it better and more succinctly, um, which my my best friend and copy editor, Carrie, would remind me is my curse. I will use 10,000 words to say something that 100 are sufficient for. But I do want to thank you, Bill, for taking the time. It's always good to hang out with you and drink coffee or drink anything, to be honest. Um, so it was great to be able to do this. Uh, please, uh, please hug Lisa for me, and I'm sure we'll be seeing each other soon. I want to thank anyone who's listened to this podcast. Again, it's new. This is just episode one. My initial one was episode zero because I just set the stage. I have no idea whether people are going to listen to this or not. So in some ways, it is self-indulgent. But when it comes to uh, sharing experiences and things like this, I think you got to put it out there. And then the what has to happen is the conversation has to start, right? Because all of this is built on experience. If you listen to anything that Bill and I said today, we didn't start out doing things the way we're doing them now. And we won't be doing them the same way in 20 years that we're doing them today. Uh, and so to have those exposures, to talk to people of varying backgrounds and experiences and, and preferences uh, is really sort of the, the marrow of life, as it were. So uh, again, thanks for sharing the ones you have. Thanks for listening to Plain Spoken. And uh, hopefully you got something out of this. If you did, follow us. I think, you know, socials are weird. I I have a love-hate relationship with social media, Bill, which we could talk about at another point. But I do have a, a Twitter or X or whatever I'm supposed to call that for Plain Spoken uh, under Plain Sight Group, Plain Sight GRP uh, is the handle. And I will be sharing these on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So, Bill Anderson, thank you very much. And for anyone listening, thank you. And we are complete for today. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show, found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the, what the.